So for visitors who have a chance to explore and experience Midlothian Mines Park who had never visited to this location before, uh, I think they will be impressed with a lot of the different uh, amenities that they find here. And obviously one of the first items that they see uh, here on the west side of the park is this large wooden monstrosity that greets them. And this wooden structure is what is known as a headstock. Now this is a reproduction, the actual size of which one of these would have been built right over top of the actual coal mine shafts here. And this particular location actually marks the middle shaft. And throughout the region here, when they were extracting bituminous coal, they actually dug deep vertical shafts that ran anywhere from 500 to 700 feet straight down. Uh, and working here in the mines, they employed a variety of different individuals uh, who came as far away as England, Scotland, and Wales. In addition to a lot of slaves and free blacks that were employed here at the mines. Now, the earliest coal mine operations in the early 1700s, uh, they were basically extracting coal by pickaxes and shovels, and they had not perfected a commercial value or scale to remove all that coal. And some of the earliest families that have links to the French Huguenots were the LaSalles, the Trebus, the Aminettes. Uh, by the middle to the latter part of the 1700s, they were perfecting ways to extract coal. And one of the earliest documented uses of coal was in 1701 by a man by the name of David Ministrier, who was using that coal for his blacksmith, or what he referred to as his smithy operation. And the earliest documented coal mine dates back to 1737, man by the name of Hannah Brummel Tullett, just south of where we are here, along Falling Creek. He operated a coal pit that he basically called the coal pit for about seven years, and that was the earliest coal mine operation. Structures like the headstock here would come much later in the 1800s when coal was being mined on a commercial scale. And this park marks the location of the largest coal mine operation that ever existed in the county, the Midlothian Coal Mine Company, that was chartered in 1836 by William Woldridge and his two sons. They owned 400 acres, and they dug four separate coal mine shafts. The one directly in front of us here would have been the middle shaft. Directly on the back side of the parking lot here where we are would have been the location of the pump shaft, originally called the Midlothian shaft. And we're going to head over to the other side of the park here shortly, and that's where the location of the grove shaft is located. And the last one was going to be the wood shaft. And these four coal mine shafts here would be some of the most prosperous coal mining that ever happened here in Chesterfield County from the early 1800s all the way to the late 1800s. Now, Midlothian Mines Park was actually established in 2000, and the following year, the Midlothian Mines and Railroad Foundation was created, and the foundation works very closely with Chesterfield County's Department of Parks and Recreation to manage the site here, and the large amphitheater was actually dedicated here in 2012 along with the headstock um, that we just focused on. Uh, these were two new additions that were added here to the park. In 2004, the area on the east side of the park, which was the first section, was actually dedicated, and that included around 49 acres. Presently today, the park has roughly about 161 acres. There's the beautiful lake that sits right behind the headstock here in the amphitheater and that provides a nice circuit loop for the visitors. And there's a small tunnel that runs underneath Woolridge Road to take visitors from the west side of the park where we are presently over to the east side of the park, which we're going to see here very shortly. And uh, over the past number of years, uh, the foundation has organized a variety of different concert series here. And every year in October, the third Saturday, we have our annual event here at Midlothian Mines Park and we utilize the amphitheater for a variety of different concert performances and a variety of different activities. For the visitors that arrive here 
to the west side of the park where we are now. There's a large parking area here and uh, between the trails on this side of the park and on the east side, that can create a good mile and a half walking trail uh, and the park gets a lot of use, particularly during the spring and fall seasons when the weather is very nice. Uh, and uh, this, these two new additions here have really added a lot to the actual heart of the park here. Okay, so we're standing here now on the east side of the park uh, and this long trail behind me, which has been a repurposed walking trail to tie into the main walking trail here on the east side of the park. This originally was a spur line, part of one of the earliest railroads that ever existed here in Virginia. And this was known as the Chesterfield Railroad. Now this was built in 1831, and we know that there was a huge impact of all the coal that was mined here, starting back as early as the colonial period. And during the American Revolution, all of this coal that was mined in this region was shipped all the way to the West Ham Foundry on the James River. And that was actually used as a source of fuel to produce cannons, projectiles, muskets, railroad track for the colonial armies. And Thomas Jefferson prized the quality of coal coming from the Midlothian region so highly that he requested that this be shipped all the way to heat the White House. We know that during the time of the American Civil War, all of this coal from Midlothian was now going to be shipped to the Tredegar Ironworks. And that is going to be the primary fuel consumption for producing all of the weapons for the Confederate arsenal. And they were shipping Midlothian coal as far north as Boston, New York City, as far south as the Carolinas, Savannah, Georgia and there was a huge impact and demand for all of this coal. Now, what makes the unique story here different from coal mining in other parts of the country is how they extracted the coal. And this was all done by digging deep vertical shafts and then accessing the coal by digging tunnels that radiate underneath the ground. And under our feet today are miles and miles of abandoned coal mine tunnels. Due to all the demand for this coal by the late 17 and early 1800s meant they needed a better way to transport all of this coal. And so the first thing that actually came about was the first road improvement, which happened in 1804, and that actually led to the construction of what we now know as the Midlothian Turnpike, which was actually a toll road to haul all of these bushels of coal from present-day Midlothian all the way to Manchester, which is now the city of Richmond. And they needed a better road system that would hold up to the spring rains and all the flooding. And this would have been the best thing that they would have had, which would have been a hard surface road. Now, the next thing that came about due to the demand for this coal was the Chesterfield Railroad. And that's what makes our story very unique because this was not powered by steam locomotives. They had not been created at this point. This was called a gravity-fed rail line. And this trail that runs directly behind me would have cut across present-day Woolridge Road and intersected with the Midlothian Turnpike. They used the power of mules that were stabled underground in the mines to actually help and assisted by power of gravity to pull roughly 70 to 100 coal cars and they were being paid six cents per bushel for all of this coal. And this was a huge improvement, and the coal mine operators were making a lot of money from the demand for all this coal. And a very wealthy mill owner by the name of Mick Nicholas Mills would be one of the first coal mine operators to benefit from this. One of the most famous engineers in the country, Claudius Crozet, engineers this 13 and a half mile railroad. And for visitors that walk on the main section of the park or this trail that runs behind me today, they literally are walking on the sub surface of where this railroad track actually was laid out. And the trains would have run directly through here, hauling coal all the way from here to Richmond. And as we explore the remnants of the Grove shaft and the 
Murphy Slope, which is on this side of the park, will tie in to some of those last important achievements that made coal mining such a very important part of the economy here in Chesterfield County. Okay, now by the early 1800s, there were a lot more coal mine operators here, what they refer to as colliers, uh, due to the demand for all this bituminous coal. Now, the difference between bituminous and anthracite coal is bituminous is a softer coal, still very good in order to produce as a source of fuel a lot of iron products and, and various different elements, but it does produce a higher content of sulfur when it's burned, which is undesirable. And these two factors, along with the loss of a lot of the other labor that was here after the end of the Civil War, would eventually hurt the coal mining industry here. And other parts of the country that were mining the anthracite coal would prosper, where bituminous coal mining would slowly be waning out. Now, by the 1820s, you had coal mine operations here, such as Union Head, Maiden, Cunliffe, Black Heath Pits, Stonehenge. Uh, the large structure behind me, this would have been the location of the Grove Shaft, built by the Wooldridge family in 1836, and directly behind me, through the center section where the frames are, uh, would have been fitted with a large ventilation fan. And this ventilation fan was needed to actually provide fresh air that was pumped straight down over 725 feet to where the men would be working. But once again, you had men and you had young boys, as young as 11, 12, 13 years of age working down there in the mines. And the boy's job would be to sort out all the coal that the men would chip away from the walls, load that onto cars, and standing next to each of these coal mine shafts was an enormous steam engine that was actually brought in all the way from Cornwall, England. And these shafts um, needed these steam engines for a number of purposes. One, they needed a source of power to lower and raise the miners and also bring up these buckets of coal. And secondly, they were prone to flooding. And directly behind me, still today, are remnants of these retaining ponds that would have been filled with all the water to make it safe for the men to go down there. But as a coal miner in 1800s, you faced a lot of dangers. Every breath you take, you're breathing in particles of coal dust that leads to black lung. They're also exposed to damps or gases. And by one swing of the hammer or the pickaxe that creates a spark, that can ignite all those gases and leads to fires. Temperatures get so hot, it literally melts together coal and iron ore. And as you walk through the park, uh, many times you can find large chunks of these. And the temperatures get so hot, it literally melts together all of this material. And so when the miners were working down in the shafts, they would smell smoke, but they wouldn't see any fire. And from where they were, they didn't see any danger. But on the other side of that wall, there was a fire raging, getting so hot, it literally popped out chunks of rock, and it made this clicking or popping sound, and the miners referred to these as clinkers. And as you walk through the park, you can see large chunks of these, and when you pick them up, they're light as air because they're filled with air bubbles or pockets. And sometimes you can find chunks as large as basketballs, watermelons, all through the park here. And for a coal miner, there were a lot of dangers they had to deal with, and they had to deal with so many contingencies here that William Woldridge had his own hospital here. And he had doctors working around the clock to provide the best medical care for the miners. And many times there were a number of cave-ins and explosions, and certainly the Midlothian Coal Mine Company was not immune to that. There were disasters that happened here at the Grove Shaft as well as the pump shaft in 1855 and in 1878 that led to loss of life for many of these miners and the last one actually led to a relief fund that was actually started by Pastor Robert Winfrey of which the Winfrey Baptist Church in Midlothian today would be named after his father and they started a relief fund and raised over fourteen hundred dollars to care for the widows and the children of many of these miners that lost their lives 
here at the coal mines. And all of the coal that would have been extracted from this mine shaft here would have been sent all the way to Tredegar Iron Works in Richmond. And it's estimated that the bulk of the material that was used to produce projectiles, railroad track, and certainly about eight out of every 10 cannons cast for the Confederacy that was made at Tredegar was made possible because of all the coal that was extracted directly behind me here. And today, this is a sleeping giant, very quiet, solitude area. But for men that were working here long ago, all of these trees would have been gone. They had brought in blacksmiths. They needed coopers to make barrels. They needed sawmill operators. And all of these trees were made huge timbers to shore up the inside of the shafts that were dug over 600 to 700 feet straight down. And coal became a viable industry here up through the early part of the 1900s. And one of the last remaining sites that we have here at the park is what we call our Murphy Slope. And this was an opportunity here, um, an endeavor to try to keep coal mining as a viable industry here in Chesterfield County. And certainly they were a factor up through the middle part of the 1900s. Okay, so we are standing now at the far end of the park here and the large wall directly in front of us, this was actually part of one last improvement that was added here to keep coal mining a viable industry through the early part of the 20th century. And in the early 1900s, the James River Coal Corporation actually steps in, buys everything lock, stock and barrel, and they build this incline double track railroad and and basically how this worked is suspended overhead by cables would have been a large coal tipple wagons of coal would have been wielded up the back side of this structure which is at an incline and there was a large wooden bridge overhead that they could wheel these buckets of coal dump it into the um, large coal tipple and that actually would grind up the coal, sort it out, and directly in front of us would have been where the track was laid. So the trains would have run directly through here and they would have had a much more efficient system to actually load up all the coal on these rail cars and then get them to the market. Um, and the James River Coal Corporation actually kept everything operating here in the early 1900s until about 1925 and that's when the Murphy Coal Corporation of West Virginia stepped in and they took over all the operations here at this site. Now, the Murphy Coal Corporation uh, had uh, basically 1,900 acres. They bought three acres of deep water terminal in Richmond and actually rebuilt 33 miners' houses. And if you visit the park during the fall when the leaves are off the trees, through the tree lines, you can still see some of the original brick platforms, which would have been the foundations for many of these homes that the miners would have used. And uh, all of these families coming as far away as Europe to work here, and they had very far walk to actually get to the site to actually mine all of this coal. Uh, the last actual coal mine operation lasted here until about 1942 in Salisbury. Uh, and that was considered the last major operation here. Uh, but when the Chesterfield Railroad was constructed and brought coal all the way from Midlothian to Richmond, that was considered to be the most successful railroad that was ever built here in Virginia. Sadly, it only lasted five years because by 1836, we had the invention of modern rail lines that actually came through the area here. In 1836, we had the Richmond-Petersburg Railroad. The Winterpock Rail Line came about in 1840. And by 1850, you had the Richmond and Danville Rail Line. And these three rail lines eventually put the Chesterfield Railroad out of business. And a much more efficient system to haul coal to market meant there was no more the need for the gravity-fed rail line one of only two that ever existed like that in the entire country. The other one was in Schoolkill, Pennsylvania. Uh, but this was a very important part of the history 
and uh, evolution of the industry here of coal mining in Chesterfield County. So the, the nice large interpretive signs that we have here, uh, a number of these have been added both on the east and the west side of the park. This one gives the visitors uh, a much better visual image of what the Murphy Slope ruins were actually like here. Uh, and uh, within this image, um, they, can, they can see the, the boiler house here, the uh, actual remnants of the railroad track that ran underneath where the walking trail exists today, and, uh, and in the large uh, bridge and underneath the um, actual uh, tipple itself. And uh, these signs were made possible due to a, um, a, a great working relationship with the Department of Mines, Minerals, and Energy and the Midlothian Mines and Railroad Foundation. Uh, DMME were able to uh, fund and, and help us add a lot of these new interpretive signs throughout the park that will give the visitors a much better understanding of the impact of coal mining here. And from the early 1700s up until roughly 1942, um, nearly close to 250 years, coal mining remained a viable industry here in the county. And um, after that point, we would have no more mining in this part of Virginia. The only other relevant area that mines coal today is really in the southwestern part of the state. Uh, but we do have a lot of evidence that the visitors will have a chance to view and experience during the course of their tour when they visit the site. Now, additional site improvements that was added here at the park, um, in 2015, uh, both of the two trails, the main trailhead and the uh, rehabbed uh, old Spurline Trail, we added uh, a railroad trestle bridge and also replaced the original bridge on the main trail uh, to be able to uh, provide access for emergency vehicles uh, or other personnel should we need to get uh, uh, vehicles down to this side of the park here. And both of these trails provide a great circuit loop for our park visitors that could start either on the east side of the park or they can get a longer walk by heading down the uh, boardwalk over to the west side of the park. Um, the other site improvements that happened here were in 2017, in which we capped off the actual uh, mine shaft, which actually sits directly over top the wrought iron fencing here. Uh, and during the process of that, uh, a variety of original items were actually recovered from that mine shaft, which is uh, completely flooded. Uh, and then one of the last site improvements here was in 2019. Uh, with the removal of the old fence and replaced with this new wrought iron fencing, complete with um, elements of sections of the railroad track here as cross member bracing that really adds uh, a nice touch to the design of this particular fence. And um, additional site improvements to come here will be restoration of the stonework here at the Grove Shaft. Uh, an installation of uh, new paver walkways here in front and a observation tower and additional interpretive signage.